read this and speak a little bit because I had such a strong, um, just almost an ache in my heart this week, watching some of the way that humanity is responding to the stress of, of illness and sickness and the way that people are, are just all stirred up and it's, it's not necessary when you have a peace that passes understanding even though the world might say we all need to be afraid, we can stand in the middle of that and be like, afraid of what? What are you talking about? Like almost as if there's a language disconnect and we don't really understand what they're trying to say. I believe we're coming to that place where it's only going to be that kind of boldness and confidence in who God is that allows us to stand without fear in the midst of what is coming on this earth and what's already been here for centuries and, and millennia. But Psalm 91 um, is, is a scripture, if you've ever dealt with anxiety or fear, uh, no doubt this was part of your uh, getting freedom from that thing that oppressed your life. And if you're still in the battle uh, for your heart and for anxiety and for fear and feeling like sometimes uh, things are overwhelming you and you just kind of have panic attacks or whatever it is, let me direct you to this scripture. There's this one of many. There's uh, this theme throughout the Bible, specifically in the Old Te uh, Testament, Old Covenant, but continuing on through the new. And it has to do um, with who God is and his position in our lives. It says this in Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Imagine being in the presence of the Lord to the extent that when you walked around, you could visibly see on the ground the shadow of who it is that's just hovering right above your life. You know, that whole six-foot social distancing rule. What if we just took that as people of faith and said, you know what, every time I think of that, every time I'm in an aisle, every time I'm uh, approaching a cash register and there's those marks on the floor, because they'll probably be around for a while, they're ugly as anything, but maybe they'll come up with some new cool uh, decorative ones that look a little bit more uh, better than just the quick tape they threw down. Um, but what if as we see these things and we're constantly reminded that we live in a world who doesn't understand that there's a peace that can provide for us. There's an understanding of safety and security that God offers his children that they don't have access to. They don't understand and they couldn't receive it except by faith because it flies in the face of all that they think will keep them safe. But what if every time we see that reality, we're reminded of this passage where it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What if we're reminded, I'm sure his shadow is much more than just six feet on all sides of us. I'm sure that the place of dwelling in that secret place where we know that God is over our lives, that he is present in every place we go, if that would affect maybe some of the confidence and boldness we could have to just share the message that this world is dying to hear and dying to see lived out. Verse, the next verse says, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. You know what a refuge is? It's a place that you run to when you don't know where else to go, that you know you'll be safe there. And there's some language that's going around. You know, you've heard it probably, uh, you know, safer at home, shelter in place. It's an amazing thing to me as I look at what the world tries to come up with to try to process their own fear. I realize that God's known way ahead of time how it is that people of faith could find peace and confidence in the midst of whatever is going on in the world around them. And he says, you know what, come into the place where I am. Come under the shadow that, that surrounds me. I'm a big God with a big shadow. And the metaphor here is of, you know, of, a, of a hen with chicks or someone who's underneath the, sh the shadow of, of, a, of a parent animal. And it says, he's my fortress. He's the refuge. He's the place where I know I'm safe, whether I'm out shopping or home. doesn't matter. He's still the place where my heart abides and stays. Therefore, I will trust in him to keep me safe. It says, surely... He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Pestilence uh, is what we're all talking about. Come on, Wendy. This is when you actually just decide to believe and you decide, okay, we can go to fear or we can go to faith. Once you make that transition in your heart and you can only do it by faith, then you read the scripture and there's a whole lot to just get excited about because it's, it speaks straight to our spirit and it gives us the courage and boldness to know that whatever's going on around us, we are not the target uh, we're not able for, the, for what the enemy is targeting us with to have success. It says that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. There's going to be stuff formed against us, but we are the children of God. We are believers in his name. Immediately, you can't even make that statement with you just feel and hear people's, yeah, but what about this and but what about that? What if we just stopped the whatabouts, ifs? 
What if we just did that for a minute and give faith a chance to actually take root in our hearts so that we could actually live into a reality that's beyond just what we can concoct in our trying to just stay strong and be secure and hope for the best. It says, surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler, and you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. He keeps talking about himself as a place you can go to. He's more than an idea. He's more than just a set of doctrines. He's more than just a place to go and worship together on a Sunday morning. He is the God who created you. He is the one who knew your beginning from your end. He has a plan for your life, and he wants to keep you in that place. And when you're in the place where he is, there's a security and a safeness, a refuge that you can live in that people who don't understand this and won't believe, won't choose to believe this, don't have access to. It says, No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. We know this is the inspired word of God because the devil used this scripture to try to tempt Jesus when Jesus comes centuries after this is written. <laughs> He knew it was the word of God, and so he knew the only thing I can test the word with, the word being Jesus, word made flesh being Jesus, is words that he wrote, that he inspired, that his spirit oversaw the penning of. And so he uses this scripture from Psalms to to show Jesus that, hey, just jump off of this thing. The angels are going to hold you up because this is a prophetic scripture about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Only with your eyes. You'll, things are going to happen around you, but his promise to us is that this is our portion. This is our reality, should we choose to believe it. He shall give his angels charge over you to bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, and you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me. The M there is a capital M. This is a prophetic scripture about Messiah. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That long life that's promised to Messiah is the life that we now get to live out by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who now lives in us. The temples that were mere flesh, mere men, now filled with the treasure of heaven. This is still true today. This reality is still true. It's our portion. I would much rather go to my grave believing in something that God told me is truth And let people pick up the pieces of whether they thought I did it right or not than to stand before him. And then, well, everybody else doubted that it was really the protection you were talking about. Like, maybe it'll work sometimes, maybe it won't. So I didn't really take the chance and the risk that you told me to do. We've got stories Jesus told. My wife mentioned one, my wife Elaine mentioned one last week. About the talents and about the servants who were trusted and the one was afraid. Every place we see in Scripture a call to faith, a call to rise up, we see fear right attached to it, coming right in behind it, trying to find a way to to take away the reality of what will happen when the children of God begin to believe. Enemy knows it. He's always been there. He's always eavesdropping in. He knows when his time is coming, and he knows that it's shorter now than it ever was, and he's more uh, engaged right now in promoting fear, than anything else. He doesn't even need people to be in sin if he can get them in fear. Fear is sin. Did you know that? Boy, I'm sure glad my wife's going to pick this up from me in a few minutes. Did you know that fear is sin? Not the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Not that one. Fear of man. Fear of what men can do to you. We are commanded not to be afraid. Let's just look at a couple of them. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We can go through 
Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, we will not be afraid. Why? Because God is with us. Every place you see, fear not. There's a reason he gives why we shouldn't be afraid. Not because you finally successfully read the whole Bible three times and now you're going to have this gift of not being afraid anymore. No, there's something that we have to embrace by faith if we're going to be people that choose not to be disobedient and to go into fear. Fear is disobedience. Fear is sin. We're commanded. It's not a suggestion. Try not to be afraid, guys. Fear not. It's a command. If you get into fear, address it, repent, say, God, show me what's producing this fear in my heart. Somehow this this thing got in. There's a space in me that does not need to be open to this voice, to this news, to whatever it is that's producing a fear response. Jesus is saying, the reason you can fear not is because I am with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The whole point of being able to not be afraid is only when you know that Jesus is with you. Only when you know that God is with you. You've got to just embrace this by faith maybe at first and let it grow on you. Let the expression of that faith as it begins to work out, let it grow and get stronger. You know, I'll just tell a story. It relates to this because my, my son, um, he's just two years old and he's just got some words. But he's not, he doesn't have understanding about, you know, math. I think he can count to like six, you know, in a six, seven eight, seven, six, you know, it's like back, he gets to a certain, he's not to 10 yet in his counting. So he, he has, he knows kind of what numbers sound like when you tell him he's counting. But I, on paper, I don't know if he'd know the difference between a letter and a number. You know, he's at that kind of age of, of learning. And so we have a digital scale in, in the bathroom and I'm in there uh, by the sink and I just, I can hear him step on it. It's got a glass top. So I try to make sure he's not carrying it around or dropping a coffee cup on it or doing something. It's and uh, so I hear it move. I quickly look over what's he doing to the scale because he tries to, you know, move it and take it where he wants to go because it's got the cool lights thing. It's digital. You know, I don't know if you remember the ones with the little wheel that spun. You could kind of cheat them a little bit. Remember those? You could kind of stand a little more on one side than the other, and you could get that wheel to just go a little one way or the, the spring, you know. But now with the digital one, you know, we've been just showing, you know, we've been just checking him out, put him on there every once in a while, see what he's at. He's like, oh, wow. You know, we just say it out loud, not knowing that he's listening. But somehow... Uh, he stepped on, I heard the scale move, he steps on, and then he said, I ain't 31 pounds. This is only two days ago, and he said, I'm 31 pounds. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, first I'm just amazed, I'm thinking, this is incredible, we have a prodigy, he's like reading numbers, and he knows, like he didn't say 0.8, because, you know, I, we didn't teach him decimals yet, but, you know, I'm just, all these thoughts are in my mind, like, well, how does this kid know this? Well, you know, it's because he had been on earlier the day before, and, you know, he remembered when he laid and said, wow, Carson, you're good, you know, good job. You're 31 pounds. You just, I don't know why you encourage kids about their weight at that age, but you're just excited. You remember when you were 29, now you're 31, and, and you're growing, you're getting bigger, you know, to see your muscles and all that stuff. And you just, you just engage with them, but he's 31 pounds, and I, and I recognize as much as I would love to be impressed with that statement that he made and think, wow, this kid's a genius. I realized he was just parroting something. He was just repeating something. He had heard the day before, and it was a big deal because mommy was excited about it. I didn't know this had happened. Um, but he told him, you're 31 pounds now. And he's, he's remembering this, and he's spitting it out, and he stands on it, and he waits for the thing to come up before he says it. And I watched him watch, and as soon as it stopped and it showed the number, like he had the timing down and everything, but he was just simply repeating something he had heard. He didn't understand how the thing had come up with that number, that it meant that his body was getting heavier. He wasn't aware of of any of the stuff behind. He doesn't know the math that a three and a one together makes 31. He doesn't understand anything. All he knows is he can be excited because mommy was excited that you're 31 pounds now. And, you know, let daddy know too. You're 31 pounds. He was just so excited. And I wish I could convey that excitement. But I feel like for... The connection I want to make to what I'm saying now about fear and about faith is that it's one thing to have someone else telling you don't be afraid. But it's a whole other thing when you let the understanding of why you don't need to be afraid sink in. And the why that you're not afraid is because I am with you. Emmanuel. Messiah came so that he could become God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. The whole point of walking out this kingdom experience is not that we do it on our own. The world looks at us and they think we're doing it on our own, but we're not because we know there's a shadow over our life. We know there's someone whose wings that we're under, and we know that he's promised to protect us and to keep us. Does it mean that we never get ill? Does it mean all these other things? Let your brain go. Let it ask all those questions, but at the end of the day, require it to come back to the truth. 
because there's only one message we have to bring, and it's the message of the gospel. He says this message will be preached to the ends of the world, and then the end will come. Jesus will return. We've got air signal and messages all over this globe reaching into just about every pocket that exists, and he still didn't come back yet. So there's a couple things going on. Either there's just a few tiny pockets somewhere that haven't heard yet, or the message has been corrupted. There's only two possibilities. I'm a, I like logic. I remember when they taught logic in schools. They don't anymore because they just need compliant. Never mind. Growing up requires you to think for yourself. It requires you to begin to crave understanding for why it is that we can have confidence in the day of judgment because we know some things that we've grown into, that they're revelations. They're just at first, maybe we just parrot them. We say, hey, I don't have to be afraid. Did you know Jesus promised that he's going to be with us? He'll never leave us or forsake us. He's with us to the end of the age. And begin to get excited about that, like Carson's excited about 31 pounds. But there's a time coming when he can't just ask someone else to read the scale for him. Mommy, how much do I weigh now when he's 10 years old? No, at some point he'll need to learn math so he can do the interpretation himself. And I feel like the body of Christ is in a season. I'm in a season where I'm trying to just focus on, okay, I know a lot of things because some of them I've received by faith, but I don't understand how they work. I want to know how they work. I want to know how it is that I can walk through some place and know no evil shall befall me. Because I'm looking around me and I'm seeing it way beyond six feet radius. I'm under the shadow of someone who said, he who dwells in this secret place of the Most High God, who abides under that shadow, he's going to be safe. Remember, there's an enemy. There's someone who doesn't want us in faith. There's someone who knows what we're capable of. There's the deceiver. There's the one who tries to sow fear into our lives. I want to just quickly say this, and then I'll pass off. When I read, I was reading through some, some text, and I think, is it Matthew 16? Where is it? No, Matthew 16 is where Jesus asked the question, you know, who do men say that I am? And they all answer in their own way. And then Peter is asked, who do you say that I am? Jesus asks him and he said, it's you. You're the, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah that's coming. You are the one that we've been waiting for. And he, Jesus says only the Father can reveal that to you. We go through that a few verses later. We find out that the enemy was there listening. Because when Peter has his commentary, he, d- d- Jesus looks to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Satan was already influencing and whispering in Peter's ear about how to take over this plan that Jesus was portraying that, hey, I'm going to get offered up. It's not going to go well for me, but it's all for the bigger picture, for the better good of all. And Peter starts to rebuke Jesus, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Satan was in this whole revelation, and part of that revelation that Peter had was who Jesus was. And Jesus said on that revelation, he was going to build a church. And that the gates of hell would not prevail against her. Talking about the collective group of believers who would dare to believe the truth of scripture. And to begin to live out and to begin to crave understanding of it. And so this this moment there, the enemy's there. He's always in the mix trying to find some way to flip things around and to mess mess up the plans of the Lord. And so the enemy's there. He's listening. But there's something about in John 14 when Jesus is, again, different book of, of the new covenant. But again, it's one of the books of the gospel. And Jesus hears that the, somehow through the angelic telecommunications or whatever, uh, he, he's hearing word from the reports of, of, the, of the spirit realm that the, that the ruler of this world, is what it says in John 4, that the rule, ruler of this world is coming, but that he has nothing in me, meaning he has no place to land. And this thought occurred to me as I read through that this week, that if Jesus had been afraid at the news, whatever, whoever the messenger was or whether it was he, was he was full of the Holy Spirit, maybe the Holy Spirit revealed it directly to his spirit, I don't know how the communication, it just says that he told his disciples, the ruler of this world is coming, therefore I'm not going to be able to talk to you much anymore. He's going to be really listening in more than ever before, trying to thwart the plans. I can't talk to you as much as I used to. The ruler of the world's coming, but he has nothing in me. And I realized in that moment, if there had been a spot in Jesus for fear to creep in, if his initial response had been anything of fear, he would have been disobedient and he would have been not the sinless lamb that he was. And I thought, what does that phrase mean when it says, he's coming for me, but don't worry, guys, he has nothing in me. 
There's that scripture that says a curse without a cause cannot land. There can be all the evil intent of the enemy, all the weapons being formed by the enemy. But unless you open that door even a crack and let him come in and put those seeds of fear in there, as long as that door is shut and you are full and you are focused on the presence of the Lord, there is no place for him to come and access your heart. He can't put a seed of disobedience. Just call it what it is. Fear is disobedience. Every time we cower back, it's a disobedience. It's a dishonoring of the one who said, I'm with you always. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Be of good courage. Read through Joshua. Be courageous. Be of good courage. Be bold. Be fearless is the, is the message of the gospel. There's no, there's no more fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Once you have Jesus, you have perfect love. Fear can't stay anymore. And just challenge yourself with this. Don't maybe challenge people that don't know the Lord yet because they're not going to understand what you're talking about. But challenge yourself. We've all got to come to a place where we are not letting fear have any, any spot in us. It's only by the Holy Spirit. It's only by this understanding of his shadow over our lives. But I want to understand more and more about this reality that we can walk in. And I believe that the depths of those, these revelations come through being simply in his presence. Because you can't rationalize some of the things that he speaks to your heart. Even in worship this morning, there were things being spoken to my heart. I didn't have words for it. I was just having a tearful moment because it just felt so meaningful and real to me. I didn't know what he was saying and doing, but I knew he was. And that's all I needed. Do you know that place with Jesus? Do you, do you have that access to his heart? Because he's paid for the way that you can come boldly before him. He's not waiting for you to get it right so then you can access his presence. He's already done it once and for all. The veil's been torn. We as children of his can come in. Will we? Or will we let the same fear that allows for a natural uh, fear to come into our hearts be the same in the spirit realm? If fear accesses your life in the natural, it's going to access your approach to the Lord in the spirit realm too. Oh, I'm afraid you're a holy God and you're this and that. I, I just... <laughs> Figured you didn't want to hear from me. I figured I was too this or too that. It says that he so loved the world because he so loved the world that he came. And I'm going to leave us with that thought. I want to try to understand because it says that we can never understand the depths of his love. But we desire to understand it. And the way that you understand it more each day is that you're hungry for it. You want more of what he's offering. You want more of that security, that promise that there is a peace for those who believe because he's with us. We might walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but fear has no claim on us. It has no place to land. Fear has a claim. Faith has a claim. The question is, what's your claim going to be? Are you going to declare faith over the things that try to come in? Or is fear going to have a bigger voice? And are you going to concede because fear just seems that much more intimidating than the truth of what Jesus has revealed to us in his word? If you're not in the word in a, in a time like this, uh, um, I'm sorry. We can't say it any other way than you need to become a student of the word. There's only uh, one place to go to find something to stand on that's not going to shift and move with the next 24-hour news cycle, and that's the word of God. It's never changed, and it's not going to change. And so if you want to stand secure, stand on that. I'd like to invite my wife to come and share um, because I know she also loves the word in the same way I do. And as we talked this week, I realized there were things that she uh, started last week and we just share so much of the same revelation as the Lord speaks to one of us. Often the other one of us is kind of getting the same feeling. So she can bring a more <laughs> feminine, <laughs> lovely angle to this. <laughs> Love you, babe. Oh, man, he's so good. Oh, if I am, is this okay? There is a place where we can finally be free of all of the earth's inhibitions and everything that this world would look to steal from us in our security and our identity. And there is a realm that allows us to see who he is, and also allows those who don't think they need a savior to recognize that they do. And that realm is the glory of God. That place is where he lives, 
It's our eternal destination, and it is what we long for in our soul. And though we may not always recognize it, it's what we were created for. It's what Jesus sent to the planet when he sent his Holy Spirit. When he spoke of the one that said, he will baptize you in power and in fire. That fire was obviously not a natural fire. There was no one that was physically harmed by that fire. That fire was the glory of God. It was the place and is the place where he lives. Every prophet that ever visited heaven recognized and described the throne room and dwelling place of the Lord as being on fire. I just love it. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. There isn't any other place. Everything else is just a cheap imitation. And I believe that what the church has become content with is the presence of God, the acknowledgement of him being with us, and that Emmanuel. But that was only the first step. See, Jesus coming was only the first part of the story. And what came after that, he said, was going to be better. So Emmanuel and God with us and the presence of God and the reality of Jesus' the spirit being alive and well in our hearts, that is only for, that's only part Let's not ever settle for only in part. I love the way it says in Corinthians, it says we, were, we know now in part, but then we will know in full. What, what then is he talking about? He's talking about when we enter into his glory. But I believe the mistake that we make is thinking that his glory is only going to happen when we enter through the gates of heaven. And I don't believe now for a second that that's actually true because when the Holy Spirit came, and he said, you will do greater things than Jesus, which is hard enough for us as humans to really understand. But it's because of the glory that was supposed to fill the earth, that promise that the entire earth would be covered with his glory. I don't believe anymore that it only is going to happen after this earthly flesh passes and we enter through those gates. I don't believe it. There's too much in the scripture that says that because us, as children of God, are supposed to have the indwelling of the glory of God, that we are supposed to be a part of that covering and a catalyst for that to happen. And so, you know, this, this subject of glory, it can get really um, tricky because the Bible talks about it so much. And if you want to study it a little bit more, there's, there's two really wonderful books that I can recommend. Um, the first being the book called Glory by Bob Sorge. And then the other one is um, written by a spiritual mentor of our pastor, Vaughn, our founding pastor here. Uh, and that was the book Glory by Ruth Heflin. Both extremely deep, extremely powerful, and if you really want to understand what you're capable of in the spirit, you read those books. There is a few ways that glory is mentioned in, in scripture. It's mentioned as a noun um, where it's talking about honor and reputation and dignity. It even talks about the glory of a man in Psalm and it talks about the glory of God. It's his reputation. Like in First Chronicles, give to the Lord, O families of the people, give to the Lord glory and strength. To give God glory means to give him praise and honor for the excellence of his being. That is the noun, glory. Then there's the glory that is the endowment of power and blessing, where it says in John 17, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. That blessing of God. We can bless. Only God can bless in glory. 
But what I'm talking about is the invasion of God's reality on the human spirit and therefore on the earth. What I'm talking about is the fire that dwells in us and consumes us and changes us. Only glory can do that. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. I love how Josh talked about Psalm 91, one of my favorite scriptures. It's a, it's a psalm that I read over my kids when they're worried about something. It's something that I have fallen asleep listening to many times. And it talks about the shadow of the Almighty. It reminds me of when Jesus was talking about how I long to gather you. Like a hen gathers her chicks, there is a very clear understanding that there is a, a pulling together and a protecting that he longs for us. I want to leave you with this. Sometimes when things are getting thick, the change that we might feel in the light around us is not the darkness of the enemy, but the nearness of his presence. The world may feel the darkness of the enemy, but he promises to draw us close. And when he draws us close, that secret place ha will have a dimness and an intimacy that he wants just for you, just for his children. That nearness, that closeness, there's no, there's no light, artificial light in there. There's only him and his presence. And so I, I honestly believe that that is for someone because you might think, oh, I'm a believer, but I still feel this, like, like not sure what it is that I'm feeling. He's drawing you in, and he's bringing you under his wings. Don't mistake that, and don't fall into condemnation saying that you th maybe you're being subject to the world's darkness. Because there is a time when he pulls you under the shadow of his wing where there will be a momentary dimness when he brings you close. That closeness is for a, an empowering of his spirit. It's for the security of our soul. I love that old song. And I'll see if I can uh, I can recite it without getting emotional. There's been some really intense things happening in my life and, and within our family, and it's been it's been really good and, and the Lord is at work and yet it can also, you know, if it touches your life, it touches your emotions. So please bear with me. But there's this thing that says, turn your eyes, that beautiful song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his glorious face. And the things of this world, they grow dim. Why? Why is that? It isn't because there's darkness in us. It's because the brightness is so much greater. It pales everything around us. It brings us to a place of understanding what we were created for and who we really are and what he really thinks about us. When we allow for that glory to really grow within us, to really be all that we have in him, we become nothing. Our own thoughts and fleshly desires are eliminated. They are disintegrated in the fire of that glory. And those around that don't think they know or don't believe that they need a savior will understand. Whatever it is, I don't have that. When you recognize where he is, that awareness allows you to see the reality of where you are. When you read in scripture, the 
men that I talked about last week, particularly Jeremiah and Daniel, good men, believing men. But when they saw the glory of God and they realized how high up and how powerful he was compared to the rest of humanity and where they were, suddenly they said, woe is me. There was such a clear understanding. It's what increased their capacity to be able to withhold more of his glory and what allowed them to walk as upstanding men above the circumstances of their life. And Jeremiah and Daniel, they walked in some pretty intense circumstances. Daniel having to function within a completely pagan society. Jeremiah living in a season where he was seeing the destruction of Israel and the carrying away of the children of Israel in bondage. Those were some really trying times. Church, I have no idea what's coming next for us. I have no idea what the future holds in detail, but I do know what the word says. It says the enemy's gonna come in like a flood. It says that he's going to come in against the church. But the word also says when he comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise a standard against him. That standard is his glory. It's more than just the little things that we feel when we know that, oh, he loves us and it's so wonderful. I'm not trying to negate that. I'm only saying that we are in danger of only living in part. When God has given us the full and he longs us, longs for us to see the full. He wants us to see the full. I just want to highlight very quickly 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where he talks about pleading the church to really understand what it is that they carry, what it is that they are commissioned to accomplish in this earth. And in chapter, in, uh, sorry, in verse 12, it says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech. What hope was he talking about? He was talking about the power and glory endowment that God longed to give to the church. He was talking about the glory of God and what that means, and the way that the church was called to function because of that glory. He says, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. What was passing away? Moses had just spent days in God's presence. So much that his whole body was reverberating with his glory. And he was so bright that people couldn't look at him. He had to put a veil over his face so that they wouldn't be scared. And there's fear again, popping up his head. And that, I mean, it says very clearly here in Scripture But as he was walking away from the presence of God, the glory of God, that glow was diminishing. And even in its diminishing, he had to put a veil on his face to protect them. Verse 14 says, but their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. That veil of his glory was supposed to be removed by by the cross. But in the same way that some Israelites' minds were blinded, we're not talking about natural, we're talking about this spiritual. Their minds were blinded. I believe that that same affliction affects us. Our minds are blinded. We don't actually see what we're meant for. We don't actually see what was accomplished by the cross when that veil was rent in two. That veil separated a place that you had better had gone through all the lawful steps of what it meant to walk into that room or you were going to drop dead. 
to the point where they put little bells on the robes of the priests because, heaven forbid, they had missed one of those guidelines and they hadn't purified themselves properly, they'd walk in and drop. The other priests outside the veil would listen for the twinkling of the bells, and if they didn't hear them anymore, it meant the priest was dead, and they had to drag him out. They would tie an ankle, a rope around his ankle. For when he walked into the Holy of Holies, that's how rich it was. That's how powerful it was. That's how intimidating it was for humanity. That was the veil he rent. His glory was released. And yet what has happened successfully but that our minds have been blinded? Until this day, the same veil remains unlifted. But Jesus has taken away the veil. But, verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Now, he's talking about Israel, Israel here. I, I understand that. I understand the history. The same can also be applied for the church who have not fully recognized and attained what the baptism of the Holy Spirit means and what it is to walk in power and glory. That thing that should be ours by nature, something that happens very, very naturally, and yet our humanity rejects it. The natural part of us is afraid of the supernatural because of all the question marks. And so we willingly allow our minds to be blinded and a veil to lie on our heart. But this is it. Oh. Verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What it is to walk through and walk out our salvation, as it says in the epistles to walk out our salvation in fear and troubling is to understand the humility that it takes to really be able to embrace what the Lord has for us. He won't submit to the proud. He won't give it to those who are unworthy. But those who call on his name can do it because he has experienced the greatness of him and the humility that it brings to their heart will allow the Holy Spirit to entrust them with his glory. There is a glory that he is so longing for us to come into. That recognition will make the church unstoppable. In the same way that a child brought into and born into a great family is not born with that knowledge of who he is. He is brought up. Whether it's because he, you know, it's, a, it's a powerful business that he will someday inherit. Or perhaps he's been born into a royal family and he will someday be crowned as king himself. He's not born with that knowledge. He is taught in it. It's why we so diligently try to teach the church. Because when you become, when you are born again, you are not immediately made privy to everything that there is in the kingdom. But it's yours. It's yours at birth. You have to be taught how to walk in it. You have to be taught how to embrace it and to accept it and understand the reality of what that means for you and the rest of your life. You have to be taught in it. So I know that we have done that. Now the only thing that is left is the unbelief that has allowed for a veil over your mind and over your heart. And it's very, very easy. That veil, it's not the three-foot thick veil that once hung between us and the Holy of Holies. It's a very thin veil. The veil of unbelief is a wisp. It's very thin. And when the Holy Spirit breathes on you and you allow for that, you just believe. 
The same strength of belief that allows for our salvation allows for the belief for that veil to be blown away. And then we can truly embrace the glory that he has for us. That place that then our time with the Lord is time not just in his presence and hearing his voice. That is part. But it is also time in his glory. It becomes a well-beaten path in our lives. A place that we can go readily. A place that we can run to and be enriched and strengthened. When Jesus separated from his disciples to spend time with the Lord, he wasn't just reading a scroll and quietly praying. He entered into the glory of God. And how do we know this? Because the one time he allowed a couple of his disciples to come with him, they saw what he'd been doing. That mountain of transfiguration, yes, we know that it happened before the cross and all of that. But I would venture to say that wasn't the only time it happened. It was just the only time that the disciples got a chance to see it. He literally entered into the glory of his father where time is nothing and was able to converse with people outside of this earth and outside of time to be empowered and that is what the Holy Spirit longs for all of you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine not just having a quiet time in reading your scripture and praying softly and those times are so precious. Please, I'm not looking to minimize any of that. I'm saying that I have to acknowledge that that is only part. And it frustrates me that we have settled for only part when all of it has been given to us. It says, I have given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. And so that, the rest of that all is his glory. It's pretty incredible. There's some pretty funny stories about uh, royal children growing up that all of a sudden they recognize there's this awareness of who they are and they march around where they live saying, do you know who I am? You know, <laughs> and then the diligence and training of how to be a benevolent ruler has to be taught because they can very quickly become a tyrant. You know, man left to themselves is a, t a dictator and a tyrant. I'm sorry. That's who we are on our own. Benevolent rulership has to be taught. But I believe that's a beautiful moment. I wish that I could just be in the minds of that little child when they're just like, whoa, my dad's the king. And I'm going to be king one day. It's like, I, I bet they, could, they thought I, they could do anything. They're invincible. I want that same revelation for the church. I, I mean, the, there aren't enough churches built in this country for the way that the churches would begin to be filled if we really understood what we are and who our dad is. But because it's this supernatural realm and we can't see it with our natural eyes, it becomes a difficulty to kind of get there in our emotions and in our soul. That's why the glory hit the earth. That's why he longs to fill it because that which is unknown and unseen is supposed to be covering it, covering us, flowing in us. It becomes natural. It becomes something that's actually tangible. We might be not be able to see it, but like the wind, we can feel it. It's undoubtable. It's a strength that comes in us that suddenly we can wake up and say, whoa, I am the righteousness of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The one who created the universe and will ultimately destroy all that is evil on this planet is my dad. And he picked me. And I have his incorruptible seed living inside of me. I hope somebody else is getting this besides me because I, my, I, I just feel like all of my insides are on fire right now. That revelation, that truth, it's what empowers you to be able to walk up to people and say, 
I know you don't need a savior, but I'm going to show you that you actually do. Because in the power that is in you is going to be so far above what they understand, they're going to understand, what they will understand is that they don't have that. What will provoke this world to jealousy is when it's all hitting the fan and the church of Christ is living above it. And we are in a place of being able to say, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Those words were not, ever, were not only supposed to be spoken by the angels that visited and by Jesus himself when he appeared to his people and his loved ones after the cross. What did he have to say first? Don't be afraid. But let us, as a church, be so familiar with the supernatural that it becomes naturally supernatural in us. Let us walk and live in his glory. Let us visit there every single day in worship and in time spent with the Father. Let's let go of what was only given in part by our own understanding. We only embrace what is in part. But he has given the full. He did not hold anything back. He gave the whole thing, the whole package. That old Prego commercial, it's in there. <laughs> Everything's in there. We don't believe it, but it's in there. Let's begin to embrace it. Let's come back together and fill this place. When it's time, there is an unleashing. And I'm praying that that begins with the gratitude. It's very difficult being separated. It's very difficult to do this. Because the church was meant to be together. But when we do come together, let's come together with such a gratitude, such a thankfulness, that it will command the blessing. It will bring such unity. Then allow the church as a whole to walk in his power and in his glory. Let's embrace it. Because that's where he looks to bring us. That will release us from all fear. It will release us from all anxiety. It will eliminate all the question marks of the unknown. And it will truly allow us to live like we know the end of the story. The end of the story has been given to us. We can read it. When we truly read it and understand it and believe it and know that we're on the winning side of it, it's going to bring us to a different place of strength. And that strength is what's going to be needed to move forward. That strength is what's going to be needed to be able to preach with conviction to our children, to our unbelieving family, to our neighbors. They're going to come with more and more questions. As things become more nebulous, they're going to have more question marks. And we don't have to walk around with those same question marks. We have the truth. The truth can be offensive. The only way to speak something offensively is if you are so convicted and convinced of it in your heart that you can speak it in a love that will transform the hearts of the unbeliever. That will bring them to a place of repentance. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for all of you. I'm grateful for the way that you've reached out to us and reached out to the rest of the church family. We as a community, though we are separated bodily, we remain unified in the spirit, and I'm so grateful for that. I bless that spirit. I bless it in Jesus' name. Let's not ever lose that. We need each other. We're created for community. The church was never supposed to be a bunch of people as an island. It was only ever supposed to be a community of believers uplifting each other, encouraging one another. And we do continue to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Father, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for Jesus. I'm so grateful for the power of your word. I'm so grateful for the glory and fire of the Holy Spirit that you've given us so freely. You didn't wait until we thought we were ready. You gave it all. 
You gave it all to explore and to experience the richness and fullness and the embodiment of who you are. Father, we continue to press towards you. We continue to open our hearts and allow you to fill us in recognition of how far above you are. We long for that place. We long to be stretched in your presence, that we can be filled with more of you. Fill your church now, Lord. Fill us, Lord Jesus. Stretch us. We say yes to your stretching. It's uncomfortable, Lord. But oh, the benefit, oh, the joy of knowing all of you, of truly understanding who you are and who you've created us to be. Oh, the gift. We will be forever grateful, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. You're so good. You're so faithful. You're never ending. We praise you for all that you're doing, Lord Jesus. For all that you're doing. Speak to the insecurities now as we center our minds and our hearts on your spirit. Speak to your children. Put your finger on those things that you want to touch. Reveal those things that are still hidden, that are not of you, that can be healed now. We thank you for your revelation, Lord Jesus. Speak about next steps, Lord. Every element of our culture right now is talking in steps. What is the next step? Father, speak to your children the next step. How are we going to move forward? At what speed? At what intensity? Be purposeful. And at the same time, increase our boldness, Lord. As we grow in the understanding of who we really are in you, that that boldness that you said the bold, the righteous are as bold as a lion. That that boldness would increase. That that strength would increase. So that when the demand is put for us to act in boldness, we are ready. We don't have to try to produce it in that moment. Father, you are increasing the boldness and the strength of your church now. As you touch your children. And you speak to them. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Heal the hearts and the minds of those that are brokenhearted now. Heal the bodies of those who are afflicted now. By your spirit, we speak to that healing. And we command it in Jesus' name. That every body, every cell, every muscle, every tissue and tendon, every bone, submit themselves now to the Holy Spirit that says, by his stripes we are healed. We claim it now as our inheritance. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. Fully complete in you. In every way, mind, body, spirit. In every way, Lord. We speak to your truth and we speak now in the boldness of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Bless someone around you. You might have a mask on, but it doesn't keep you from speaking. Take the opportunity when you're out in public to speak truth and peace and security to the ones around you. There's a whole lot of fear and insecurity floating around, but we carry something that they need. Don't hold it in. Have a great week.